Hello, Dave Soriano, Associate Professor of Chemistry with the University of Pittsburgh's Bradford campus in Pennsylvania. This is a lecture outline which introduces Chapter 1 in a course I teach for Petroleum Technology and Environmental Studies majors, among others, uh, other majors, Chemistry of the Environment. The textbook we use is Chemistry in Context, published by the American Chemical Society, 7th edition. This is Chapter 1, The Air We Breathe. What is in the air that we actually breathe? Good question. Can air be dangerous to our health? How can understanding chemistry help us decide? The composition of our air, chemists would describe it as a homogeneous mixture of gases. Nitrogen, diatomic nitrogen N2, comprises about 78% by mass of our atmosphere. Oxygen, 21%. Other gases combine for a contribution of 1%. Looking at a bar graph here, we can see uh, the same figures as shown in the pie graph. It's a mixture, a physical combination of two or more substances present in variable amounts. Now, diatomic nitrogen is a very stable material. The Latin term would be a Z, or stable, inert. And just about the only way you can get diatomic nitrogen to react in the atmosphere is by contact with lightning, where nitrogen oxides will form. And of course, there are ligands, nodules on cereal crop roots, that can fix molecular nitrogen and convert it into nitrites and nitrates. But uh, nitrogen is an amazingly stable material. Now, what's in a breath? Typical composition of inhaled and exhaled air. Nitrogen, oxygen, argon, carbon dioxide, and water vapor. The inhaled air, 78 nitrogen, 21 oxygen, 0 0.9 of inert argon, and only about uh, 0.04% carbon dioxide, and the water vapor can vary. Now, the exhaled air, uh, you will find the nitrogen is the same. Notice the oxygen depletion occurs. You're down to 16% argon 0 0.9 and the carbon dioxide 4.0 and that's due to the metabolism occurring in the body and as combustion occurs of sugars and lipids fats you're forming energy and water vapor and uh, exhaling carbon dioxide now concentration terms that you need to know for a study of environmental science you can express uh, data with parts per hundred. And everybody knows a penny is a part per hundred. It's a part of a dollar. It's a one percent. Parts per hundred percent. Parts per million, ppm, is used often in environmental science. And uh, now, with more, far more sophisticated instrumentation and the ability to detect very small amounts, we routinely even use parts per billion. So the atmosphere is 21% oxygen, and that means you have, um, yes, 21 oxygen molecules per 100 molecules and atoms in air. Midday ozone levels, researchers tell us, can reach about 0 0.4 ppm, parts per million. So that would be 0 0.4 ozone molecules divided by 1 times 10 to the 6th, a million, huh? molecules and atoms in air. Now part per billion sulfur dioxide in the air should not exceed 30 ppb. That would be 30 sulfur dioxide molecules divided by 1 times 10 to the ninth molecules and atoms in air. So it depends on what you're studying and the amounts that could be of concern to the ecology you're investigating. Now 21 percent means 21 parts per hundred and uh, means 210 parts per thousand, 2100 parts per 10,000, 
21,000 parts per 100,000. And it can also be the same as describing it as 210,000 parts per million. The difference between parts per hundred and part per million is a factor of 10,000. The bad gases, carbon monoxide, CO, ozone, O3, sulfur oxides, and nitrogen oxides, and particulate matter, the abbreviation being PM. We'll take a closer look at each of these uh, one at a time. Now, air pollutants, risk assessment. R risk assessment involves evaluating scientific data and making predictions in an organized manner about the probabilities of an occurrence. Toxicity is, uh, preoccupies itself with intrinsic health hazards of a substance. Exposure is the amount of the substance encountered. Calculate the risk assessment of the amount of ozone in the air between the hours of 4 p.m. and 6 p.m. where you live. Note, you may have to go online to access information from the EPA to help in your calculation. But this shows you immediately the preceding slides, how you can bring them together to already begin to assess data. Now, scientific notation, we need a review of this uh, in this uh, study of chemistry and the environment. 11,000 can be expressed as 1.1 times 10 to the 4. 0 0.00021 can be expressed as 2.1 times 10 to the minus 4. 0 0.001021 can be expressed as 1.021 times 10 to the 3rd, minus 3. 1730, well, that could be 1.73 times 10 to the 3rd. 6.022 times 10 to the minus 23, well, there's all your zeros, and now you know why we use scientific notation, because we're sometimes dealing with very small and very large numbers. Uh, when you see this number, instead of trying to tell somebody on the phone how many zeros are involved, you would simply say, well, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, and that has special significance to chemists because that's Avogadro's number. One mole of anything, it's a measuring device, is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. So if I say you have one mole of carbon atoms, you have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. We're dealing with very small materials, atoms and molecules. So we're routinely dealing with very large numbers. This is the conclusion of part one. Please continue along with Chapter 1, Part 2.